also looking uh, more like nature actually because this is right. the way nature operates and if we look to, towards nature we see perfection in, in this there's nothing wasted in nature right right the tree dies in the forest and it feeds all kinds of other organisms so it supports everything so that's kind of what we're thinking about here so growing mushrooms on the spent grain is the prime idea Welcome to Stout Conversations, where every week we sit down with creative thinkers in the craft beer industry and beyond. Your hosts, Ken and April, live and work in a 24-foot RV, traveling the country in search of great stories around a great beer. This week, we talk with Jim Luters, patriarch and head brewer at Wildwood Brewing in Stevensville, Montana, just south of Missoula. From van lifer to brewmaster, Jim has designed a sustainable brewery that is unique and worthy of a stop on any tour of Montana. His integrated systems and organic brews offer consumers an experience that is rarely seen in the brewing industry. The beer, the brewery, the tap room, the architecture are truly a work of art. We're in um, Steve I, right? Yeah, that's the, the, the short. That's right. You, learned, you picked that up. Yeah. Yeah. So it's <laughs> Stevensville, but we call Steve I here. The locals will call it Steve I for short. So yeah. uh, call it the oldest in Montana, the oldest uh, city or town in Montana. Oh, that's right. We have, so I settlers came here me. real early on, and that's kind of their claim to fame is, you know, one of the oldest settlements in Montana. They say the oldest town. And you're one of the longest brewing brewers in Montana. <laughs> yeah, I'm I guess that's just, the old that's just I no, yeah, that snuck old. up on me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hopefully I don't look, look the part too much, but, you know. I've been doing it a while, commercially for, well, since 87, so. Right, we're at Wildwood right now um, in Steve I. And I started uh, like you guys did as a home yeah. brewer. In my early college days, the early 80s, I was a home brewer. Right, and a lot of guys did do that and still do mm -hmm. and make that move up to pro, but you, you kind of took it a little bit different route and took it a little further because you were a pro brewer for a while, but then, I mean, you went all in. Yeah, like, so I, I, was, for... I was fortunate, too, because when I went to Germany, when I went to Dolman's Academy to study brewing studies, uh, it was, they offered the brewer, the master brewer's program condensed into one year mm -hmm. for an international group with no vacations. So uh -huh. the German students would go two years. Okay. And uh, you get your master's degree if you graduate from, from the two-year program. But there's huge vacation times, you know, summer, right. spring. All, just Which like, is a pretty like traditional European thing, too. Right? Yeah, traditional right. European. And the first year is like getting all the, the class up to the same speed in mathematics and all these other things. Because they come from all over the country and even out of the country. So they, I was lucky that they had this program, and I just happened to be there for it for that year. They didn't do it the next year, and they've never done it since. Oh, wow. So, so I was really lucky because I got the master's program in a year in the English language. And there was an international group of students there. Like in my class were the head of the Coors Brewery, head of the brew house, head of the cellar, and head of packaging were all in my class. Oh, wow. And they worked okay. directly under John Coors. These are the three guys right under John Coors. They were in my class, and then there was brewers from all over the world. The head brewers from breweries all over the world. So they would send their key person to get, to get up changed. to speed and, and you just the latest technology. It, you did it on your own. I mean, yeah, you actually fact, had to leave I, your job, right? I think, I, yeah, I left my that, job, so. and I was, I think, the only student paying his own way. <laughs> so I really wanted an education because I could imagine myself flicking Deutschmarks out like every minute. It was so expensive you, to do that. You quit your job. And you went to do a year-long brewing program. How do you pay for that? Yeah, you without know, a job. I know, and I wasn't a rich person at all. Because I heard there's a story behind how you paid for it. Well, I restored a, a 1952 Chevy pickup truck, which here in Montana you could get, you'd find them on every street corner almost. And yeah, riding, that's what somebody has out in their farm, back, right? Pickup. Yeah, about in yeah. the backyard, and you're like, hey, so I actually, I actually yeah. towed yeah. this carcass home. Uh -huh. And it came with boxes of parts, engines and pieces and parts. Okay. And it took me two years and I restored the thing. It looked really pretty. I painted it myself and yeah. uh, made a nice truck out of it. I shipped it to Germany. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I drove it around Munich for like eight months. And that was I your sold sales it. pitch was drive it around and make <laughs> and everybody And it still salivate. had Montana <laughs> license plates on it. I had an international driver's oh, license. Really? And wow. I drove it around cool. Munich and then I finally sold it. And the guy that bought it was a young fellow, and he gave me 15,000 Deutschmarks, which wasn't really enough for tuition. Okay. 
It was a lot of money though. That's in, yeah. in, in, it was like eleven thousand U.S. dollars at the okay. time. And this was and this was a three a three hundred dollar pickup that I bought in Montana. Oh wow! So <laughs> so a good return on your sweat equity. So the guy gave me it. cash, and I walked into the director's office the next day, and I dumped the cash onto his table. <laughs> I walked into the, the director of the school's office, and I dumped the cash onto his table. <laughs> And I asked him, is this enough to pay for tuition? Because he knew I hadn't paid yet all of it. You right. know, I paid a down payment to get enrolled. And he didn't even count it. He says, yeah, they'll do. <laughs> and all I cared about was getting the piece of paper. So we have no idea. And, and I imagine if I walked out the door, I imagine he just opened the desk door and shoveled it in. I'm sure that's what he did. Like, how did, how did you come to Wildwood here in, in Steve because um, I know you know you worked a long way, but this is a big ambitious project. Well, I didn't have my job, and I went to Portland and set up the brew house that you saw a moment ago, right? Uh, in '92, and then I moved back to Montana in '94 uh, or in '93, I guess it was, and I uh, started getting calls from people that want to set up, help setting up a brewery. So I started traveling and helping people set up breweries. So I got thrown into consulting just on a, uh, you know by chance. Right. And uh, I'd get a job, and a little time would go by, and then I'd get another job, and more time, which was a cool lifestyle for a young bachelor. Yeah. You know, because I made I make good money. You know, hourly rate yeah. was great. I made it with so much time off to go play and have fun because oh, I like. Awesome. I told mention I like to ski. Yeah. I like to go in the backcountry. I used to fly hang gliders. And I'd go flying all the time. I'd take my rig with my glider and all my toys and go travel out to a brewery startup job. And I'd camp oh, wow. and set up a brewery and then go to the next one. So that was a cool life. So you would go camp. Did you, did you live in an RV by chance? No, no. I lived out of my van. <laughs> I lived out hey, of my even van. Even better. I was in van life. Oh, yeah. So travel around. That's, that's a pretty cool way to go when you're young. Yeah, I like to make your way in the world. I mean, it was fun. Well, here's here's what it was. Getting paid well for it. Yes. Out of your van oh, and, and, norm, and, a young, and I was a young man, so it's yeah. usually reserved for older guys that are almost retired or semi-retired that have yeah. been working the trenches in their industry for decades. Usually, the consultant right. is that character. I would say. So, and I was learning a lot, and I was like a very open mind. I'm still this. This is my philosophy: is very open mind. There's so much to learn, and no one person can know it all. So oh, you gosh, have to. No. There's, there's about no, anything. It's that's what's cool about the profession. Actually, it's endless. You can never know it all because oh, yeah. it's it blends chemistry and microbiology and physics. They all come together. And there's very few professions. And art. And, then and it's an, an art, art form. Right there. It's really only a science when you have to replicate the same thing day in and day out. Otherwise, it is an art form. I mean, that's why it's called right. craft beer. And you're yeah. You're kind of crafting it. Right. Craft I'm with you. You're yeah. always 100%. a student. That's right. You're I think always it's really cool that learning. you're always a student. So when I went to each job, I would work with specialists in you know like the the steam fitters the refrigeration specialists the plumbers electricians all those guys and I would pick their brains and learn from them because they had been working for decades in their field and I didn't have that knowledge and I would take notes when I got back to my my van <laughs> I'd take notes and write it all down and I was armed with that information for the next gig so it was like on the job training getting consultants fees and having a lot of free time. Yeah. To have was fun. there always a goal of eventually opening your own brewery then down the road? That was in the was background. It but kind I, of just I, simmering in back the background because I didn't a, have resources to do anything like that. Mm -hmm. So things changed for me. But I ended up buying this system that you see. Right. So Saxer Brewing went out of, folded the company uh, right as the first bubble burst was happening. So early 2000s. Okay. So. That transition yeah, from I don't know if you. Yeah, there was a, the first bubble. A bit, it was like then. huge growth in the industry, and then it was still growing, but it panned off for a little bit there. There was a period, and there was a lot of closures, and it was a really bad time to sell used brewing equipment. And here he had used a brewing equipment. But a good time to buy it. <laughs> yeah, it was a good time to buy it. So Especially when I you found, know the equipment. I knew the equipment better than anybody, and right? Because I really set it up. beautiful artistic equipment. And too, I, I offered my, I, I knew it was available because I saw it on the market. I was like, oh my God, they're selling that stuff. And I wanted it. Yeah. So I called my old employer and, and I said, I'll give you 50 grand for it. And so in, in May of 2002, I bought the system. Mm -hmm. I raced out to Portland 
and I loaded three flatbed trailers myself. I rented a forklift truck, took it out of the warehouse, and loaded the trucks, and I raced the trucks and beat them back to Missoula, and I didn't even have a place to put them yet. Wow. So it, it, ha it happened <laughs> so fast, and I didn't know that. I didn't even have the 50 grand yet. <laughs> so I had to come up with that real fast. Yeah. What, what car did you build to buy that? Yeah, one? I restored yeah. A, a 1969 BMW 2002. Wait, so you actually and had And this the was the maiden voyage for it. I nice. raced it out the, poor, the first miles on this car. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Nice. I took every nut and bolt off that car and, and painted it myself. And everything. Wow. So that was fun. So there, there I had it, you know, and I had this, and I found somebody to squat, and, you know, to dump the equipment off in their backyard, and hey, for free, you just stash it for in somebody's free, yard, right? Although, it, no yards cost. in Montana are big. So, because I didn't, I was like, what am I going to do with it now that I have it? So I was either going to a, I was going to start figuring out how I might build my own brewery, and finance that, and all the all the things that you can imagine. Or if that doesn't work out, then I'll hopefully I'll sell it in a couple, three years and maybe make a little money if I'm lucky. Right. That was plan B. Hmm. Cool. Well, you can see where I what plan shook, shook out there. But. So it took me, though, years to do that. So it was 2012 when we opened, March 2012. Wow. So, so in 2009, in I started restoring it and building this site. I got the site and I scratched ground in 2009. It took me two years to build this building, which was mostly my labor, largely, other than some framing carpenters, mm -hmm. and uh, a year to put a brewery inside, which was almost all me doing that work. So three years is a long time to build a brewery, but I just picked away at it day by day, and I also would get a consulting gig here and there, and it would okay. take me away. So that, and but definitely explains why it would take a while too. Is yeah. just you're doing a lot yourself. You're Working, funding it, and I and I did and it as thrifty as you could imagine. Anybody doing that project, right? Because this isn't just a new construction. I mean, you did some pretty unique things. To I build thought this place. about it a long time how I wanted my brewery to be, and I, I had lots of time to plan it and mm -hmm. think about it. And I made, I think, a building with lots of character, and I made a very good functioning brewery that's efficient. And uh, I did it on a shoestring budget. It took me longer. You can do them in a hurry, but they cost more money, and you may not get the results that you that you like or want. Well, and you're also doing some cool things here because maybe you can talk a little bit about this. I mean, you you didn't just go order a bunch of new materials from you know wherever Home Depot or whoever and. You know, you used a lot of reclaimed materials, and you're you're reusing and upcycling. And you know, the term now is upcycling, but probably wasn't at the yeah, time you were building. Right, you just right. like salvaged, reclaimed, repurposed a lot of it. Um, I think I read where you use things like um, like ash from the coal. Fly ash, thirty percent was all they would let me put into the co all the concrete has like thirty percent fly ash in it, and that's a waste stream in Montana. And that was just a decision to find a way to use that material so it doesn't just sit there yeah. and waste? Or? Well, it's just it's just everything, all the materials I choiced, I thought about where did they come from, how were they made, and I tried to get local as much as possible right. and, and, and use something that wasn't virgin material that was recycled or upcycled, as you say, right. or had some sustainable theme to it. Right, because I mean, a lot of this timber is from an old barn, right? Right, the, the barn frame was built in 1901. It was in Menominee, Wisconsin. We took it apart, tagged everything, you know, drew, made drawings, and stood it up here. And then Straw Bale Walls, which is a local resource. And uh, the metal roof was made in Missoula by Epic Steel, and they claim that there are 100% recycled metals in their roofs. Okay. The windows were made by Claussens in Missoula, so instead of getting windows from afar, I bought them locally. Right. Every choice, I thought about that. You know. So I'm very passionate about brewing, and I'm, I'm passionate about sustainable systems. So those so are two things that come together. You're talking about like your systems and your sustainability, and I know you also want to do a lot of integration. I guess yes. and like how because you had a question on that one, Kenny. Like all the different plans that you have, right? Like you, your brewing you've laid system. out some pretty ambitious plans to make everything kind of fit into its own little ecosystem almost here. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the focal point. 
the brewery is the focal point. But I mean, you've put that out there for everybody to see too. You're not just like, maybe I can make it happen someday. You put some pressure on yourself to make it happen. But I mean, how far down the road are you on that? And how do I don't even know how that evolves because I was like, wow, that is. It sounds incredible to have all of these elements working hand in hand, have this kind of symbiotic relationship flowing all over the place. Mm -hmm. But how far down the road have you gotten with those plans? Well, that's a this is a follow the dream thing. This project and it's the reason I chose this site in Stevensville uh, was because it had three acres available to me, and that was kind of the bottom line. I decided I needed three acres if I was going to do my dream project. We can continue along. Right. with what we want to do here with Wildwood, which is build an integrated farming system around the brewery. And what I mean by that is using the waste streams coming out of the brewing process as a value-added input to another process. Right. So instead of a waste, uh, it becomes, it's an output, first of all, mm -hmm. and it becomes an input to another process that creates another revenue stream where there wasn't one before, uh, instead of being a cost, because waste streams are typically an expense. Right, so instead of throwing away your spent grains from brewing, you put those into another right. element of the, of the farm right, and exactly. you feed other uh, organisms yes. that then create something that feeds another portion yes. and another portion. So it's so looking the, more like nature, actually, because this is right. the way nature operates. And if we look towards nature, we see perfection in, in this. There's nothing wasted in nature, right? Right. The tree dies in the forest, and it feeds all kinds of other organisms, so it supports everything. So that's kind of what we're thinking about here. So growing mushrooms on the spent grain is the prime idea, because they come out of this process pasteurized, you know. Right, because you boil them. We so. cook them <laughs> ahead cook of time for hours. So if you were a mushroom grower, you would have to find your substrate, probably buy it, and have shipping fees to get it to you and you'd have to use a lot of primary energy to make it sterile so to speak so mm -hmm. because you can't have any competing organisms when you inoculate it with the spawn that you want to grow your mushrooms then it's got to be that just that otherwise you get a mess so we have those two things taken care of here at Wildwood so we want to grow mushrooms on, on this material so all the breweries including us like today, the farmer came and picked up my spent grain, okay. yeah. and they took it away, and they're going to feed their pigs and their cows, which is better than nothing. At least it's not getting thrown out. At least it's not getting thrown out, but this material is down to about 2%, 2 to 3% carbohydrate. Because I measure it, by the way. I take all the goodies out to make my beer. Mm -hmm. And a trace of protein, maybe 1%, one, 1 to 2% in protein is left in that material. The rest is cellulose and lignin bound together, which the animals do not break apart real easily. Okay. So even the cows and the pigs don't have the stomachs to create a lot of energy for themselves. So even that's not a very... No, it's not. It's really a poor food for these kind animals. Of a it, it's Well, it creates Some gas in their good. bellies, and which, which is a large greenhouse gas contributor, okay. and all the rest. So it's just not ideal. But what organism does nature provide that breaks cellulose and lignin all day long and loves it? And that's the fungi family. So growing mushrooms on that material is a beautiful thing. Right. And you can grow oysters on 100% okay. brewer spent grain. And those are tasty. So you could grow oysters here in Montana? Yeah. And not mushrooms. the Rocky Mountain kind. <laughs> yeah, right. No, I'm talking about <laughs> oyster mushrooms. <laughs> Can you talk more, Jim, about your beer? You, it's organic? Is yeah, it, beer is 100% kind of organic. Yeah. And, and, and uh, one of the main reasons is to use that downstream so all the residues would be under the same umbrella. Okay. You understand? Okay. So that's an right. important factor for going organic. Besides, philosophically, I believe in it. Mm -hmm. It's a sustainable way to farm, and we need to all be doing this or thinking about doing this you know, in the future. How would you define like beer as organic? Like, what would be kind of your definition for that? Because it seems to have gotten like skewed maybe over the yeah, years. Yeah, well, organic, it's a very strict uh, way of producing something, and the, all the ingredients used did not use petroleum-based or chemical or synthetic-based fertilizers and pesticides. That's very important. And uh, so organic farming is a much kinder way to produce our food because this idea of using petroleum products to keep our monocrops going 
has a finite number of years mm -hmm. that we can do that. And then systems are crashing. Systems are already crashing right now. There's a lot of evidence towards that. So we only get so many years to do that, so it doesn't make any yeah. sense to keep doing that, right? Mm -hmm. And we're trying to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels anyway. Mm -hmm. So maybe we should think of a better way to produce our food. And so you get a lot, it's more intensive on smaller parcels typically, but you get a lot more from it. So uh, organic farming is kind of the future. Do you see like beer coming back around to malt styles a little bit more lately or because like it for a while now hops have been the sexy rock star <laughs> yeah, you know jumping around yeah, and everybody's true. like oh, what's the hop what's the, you know yeah. what's the latest IPA yeah, yeah and, and that's interesting, interesting now some of the IPAs are kind of getting a little crazy but yeah no do you feel like true. there's any kind of a, a pushing back around or um yeah there will be I think um, but I think more. here my opinion on this is uh, you can add a fair amount of hops to a beer, but it needs to be balanced with something. You know, I think the idea of just putting, uh, you know, 60, 70 or more BUs in a beer is kind of ridiculous a little bit. You know, I mean, if, if it's not balanced, it's like, I think of it this way, if you're a chef and you're going to produce the, the most world-class dish for somebody, mm -hmm. you put just the right amount of herbs and garlic and things in there. And you can't overpower it with any one of those things, or it's just not going to be a good dish. Right. So it has to be balanced. So if you're going to put a lot of hops in, like some beer styles, even classic styles, do have, like the Pilsner, you know, the Continental Pilsner, or the IPA that came out of Great Britain. Yeah. That was but it needs to be balanced with some malt. And when it when it does that, then it's be a beautiful thing, because what you want the drinker to do is to drink the glass readily, easily, and get to the last drop and put their glass down and think to themselves, wow, that was so good, I have to have another one. <laughs> and if you don't do that, if the brewer does if they're fighting through a glass and there's this yeah. lingering aftertaste for a long time, I say there's probably a mistake with that beer. Okay. Speaking of good, good beer that you're drinking, what are you drinking? Um, this is organic, ambitious lager. Just a lager. Yeah, That's well, it's a Munich. A it's it's, my, it's my version of a Munich-style Helles, technically. So, which, and a Munich Helles, you say it like kind of that sweeter. It's got that kind of sweetness to it. Yeah, it's got it's balanced with malt yes. and hops, and it's not you know it's right in there. Yeah, this is a very well balanced beer. I mean, that's the intention anyway. Yeah. And and brewers do their best to strive towards that. And a world class beer is one that's perfectly in balance and demands another one when you finish it. D just demands another one. It's like it has it leaves you with question marks over your head, like wow, what was that? You know, I had the opportunity to go to the Pilsner Urquell Brewery in Pilsen and met brewers there. Source. And, <laughs> and yeah, it's like and when you drink it fresh at the brewery, it's one of those world class beers. Mm -hmm. And it's got 40 BUs, or 38, I think. It's like up there, but it has a good amount of malt sweetness left. And you get this powerful hop at the beginning, but it totally disappears and vanishes, and it's gone when you finish your sip. The malt just makes your palate water enough to take, tear it right off. And you're like, whoa, what the hell was that? Give me another one. You have to have another one. <laughs> it's hard to stop drinking it. It's so good. It's that good. And that's the, my definition of a world-class beer, one that gives you that experience. The rest of them are just trying, trying to get there. How much of the beer world out there would you say is just trying? There's a few. I mean, this, uh, the industry is still young, I would say, in the United States, yeah. and it's still growing up. Maybe we're teenagers. We're unruly yeah. teenagers. Which yeah, is teenagers. To teenagers right like now. to experiment, oh and that's a lot of that's <laughs> going on right and now. You're always wondering how you survive your teenage years. Yeah, and right. some, really good. And like there are you know, there kind are of, a few teenagers like that. out there that are not going to that aren't surviving this. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's less about what's in the can bottle than what's you know how you market it. Yeah, I hate to say that, but it, it's the truth, and I learn this every day by the school of hard knocks. Mm -hmm. So I, you you. To make a really good beer, this is how you get a repeat customer. But you have to get it in a consumer's hand in the first place. And how do you do that? Marketing and having the right people and the channel of distribution to get it to the consumer. 
And if you don't have that, you're going to fail too. Yeah. So there's a lot more pieces to the puzzle. So when I first started this industry 30 years ago, you could brew it and they came. So you have a lot of stories and you're definitely not shy about telling your stories <laughs> on your website. Do you have a favorite story that you'd like to share or a way to um, sum up all the experiences you've had? Because you've had, like, I love it. I could stay there for hours reading all that. Oh, it's well, well written. I'm happy to hear that. Happy yeah. to hear that because that's. Well, that's the tricky thing, is how do we, as a small brewer, tell our story and get our story out to the, to the public and the consumer? You know, I mean, we're in a commercial business, you know. I, I want to make money, sell enough beer so I can put it into these, these integrated systems I plan to do, into the next project. And we're a little bit stalled with that. Everything's ready. It's designed and dimensioned, ready to go. But time and money, I, I'm low on time because I intend to do most things myself. And uh, the money's the other thing. Um, I think money's out there, it's almost easier to find than time in lots, you know, lots of cases. And so we are struggling in a busy marketplace and cannot get wholesalers to pick us up. Because they're just filled up and they don't want to take any new. And that's the story. That's why we need, they need competition. We need some third and fourth distributors in the area instead of the big two. And when I say big two, it's there's the Anders of Bush and then the Miller Coors. Those are the big two that dominate in any given town or region almost anywhere. And we there's some third wheel distributors starting up as specialty distributors and just selling the specialty craft brands that nobody else has. And that's really great. In the bigger cities you'll see that. Yeah, I mean, even if we didn't make these videos and, and, and talk to people like you on camera, we would be here picking your ear anyway because we love this kind of concept of a brewery something different something funky so and off yeah we hope we can help you know. tell it's your a, story because you're already doing that and it's it's brilliant yes oh thank you and i hope you can too and, uh, and i appreciate your efforts in doing that generally for us brewers that are trying to make a name for ourselves that's a good thing that's a cool thing hats <laughs> off to you guys for doing that no, no, cheers, hats off cheers to that nice. <laughs> well and on that question. note i would say so we're living a stout life that's what we call ourselves and that's kind of a double meaning for us which is we love the beer but we also it's about more than just the beer it's about it taking in life and experiencing it right but we always like to ask people that we talk to like for you Jim what it, is what is your ideal of living this out life for you not for me or anybody else but for oh. you. well good question um, this is a lifestyle choice for me and uh, you know, I think it's probably evident to you both. Uh, if Jim wanted to make money, he would be somewhere else. Oh yeah, you if could he, easily if he, be consulting if all Jim, the time. Yeah, or, or maybe <laughs> or something. Maybe yeah. I'd go work for Anheuser Busch and probably pull. Yeah. My colleagues that worked at Coors were at, in 1990 were making 125 thousand a year. Right now they're making much more than that. So you know, I mean, that's not bad. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if you're if you're about if you're about the money, then there's other ways to get money. But obviously, this is, has never been about the money for me. It's more about a lifestyle and my choice of this location, and those those are all considerations. So yeah, I guess living that is. Uh, so maybe uh, I could say to people, young viewers out there, follow your dream. Um, and theoretically it should pay at some point but there's rewards that are past money I mean certainly we all need it we gotta pay the bills and stuff and take care of ourselves um, but there's other ways to measure uh, success and measure uh, you know happiness and those kind of things so, that. Cheers. 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 I love that. <laughs> we have new conversations every week. Be sure to subscribe to Living a Stout Life so you don't miss out. We love telling stories. If you have a story you would like to share around a great beer, let us know. We'd love to have you as a part of Stout Conversations. Well, I'm uh, chilling it down. Uh -huh. So you need to put your hand on that and feel how cold it is. Oh, oh, yeah. that, that's boiling hot almost. Really? And then that's what it's coming out at, like 50. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. 950. Yeah. What are you doing right now? Oh, that's a spot. Okay, you're bought. Yeah. 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 Ye
Negative temperature here. Um, adding pure oxygen in line. Right here. Mm -hmm. Very cool. yeah. So this is a classic four vessel greenhouse, which you probably don't see that many. No, not at all. Because you don't see a lot of copper either. Yeah, most that too. Right right you see a lot of steel. It's beautiful. Because most well, of the ones we've seen are ale houses too. A lot of them, most of them. Yeah, I can travel around a little bit myself, you know, the two vessel. Yeah. Because it saves space yeah. and it saves money you know, by two vessels. So they take the four processes, the four parts of the brew house process, and put it into two tanks. Right. So it's a compromise, right? Because that tank is now not optimally designed for one purpose. It's a compromise. Right. Two. So this is a four vessel. And uh, this system is, I built it myself and plumbed it, and uh, it's so flexible, you can move anything you can imagine. Any beer you want to do? I can do some fun. true decoctions. Then, you know, do I did one day, as a matter of fact. Good. I thought, yep. So, yeah, not too many brewers are doing that at all. Even brewing lagers, I don't think a lot of people are doing the decoction method in right. right? Yeah, it, it, it just, adds a special element. And I do it on a few different of my things, not all of them. What do you think you get from using Well, that? here's the analogy I'd like the to use. Um, when you're making a soup at home, mm -hmm. it's a good idea to saute the vegetables first before you put them in the water. If you just put vegetables in boiling water, you don't get a lot of flavors out. I mean, it's good, it's still soup, but if you saute them first, you get this Maillard reaction, the browning reaction, Lots of intense flavors come out of that, right? Right. And put that in the soup, and then the soup is just like elevated. Well, if you're looking at it, you see that's what the brewers call hot break or trube. Yeah. So what it is is it's um, the spent hops and also the bigger proteins that coagulate during boil. Mm -hmm. Right. The stuff you don't want, so you can make it through into the exactly into the beer. Good point. So you're onto it because this vessel. Go back down there because it's about ready to run out. <laughs> this vessel's got a very important purpose. It separates that true mm -hmm. from the clear liquid. Right. And if you were to put your finger in that after you're done and put it on your tongue, you'd be like, yeah, yeah, be horrible. Wow, that's <laughs> not good. Well, you don't want any of that. The, the objective is to get 100% of that removed from the I fill a keg aseptically mm -hmm. and press it in line as it's being cast out. Oh, really? Okay. okay. Hear that noise? Yep. Now I'm bringing water. And I'll try oxygen. You can follow me over here. I'm going into this tank. Okay. And now I'm waiting for the water to come. You can see it's still here, or more, actually. Right. Here it comes. Yeah. There it is. Now your tank, tank is full. <laughs> Another brewery tank. Nice.